We believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We are the church and we stand as one. We are the church and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the Virgin Birth. We believe in the Virgin Birth. We believe in the Resurrection. We believe in the Resurrection. That Christ one day will return to earth. Christ one day will return to earth. Holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy, worthy is our King. Because we believe, we believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in eternal life. We believe in His blood that frees us. We believe in His blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. To become the bride of Christ. Holy, holy, holy. Because we believe, holy, holy, holy is our God. Worthy, worthy, worthy is our King. Amen and good morning. It was a little better than first service, wasn't it? Not quite. It was a little better. Good morning. Good morning. I know it's a beautiful sunny first Sunday of June here in Huntsville, Alabama. Not really, right? But we're glad you're here regardless of the weather. And you'll notice that someone is strangely absent. Do you have a little piece of your heart gone that Jody's not here today? I know I do. He is on away in Georgia on family trip and much deserved and hopefully getting some rest and recreation. We're happy that he's not here. I mean, we're happy that he's getting that. <laughs> so in thinking about, well, what could I do on this Sunday when Jody's not here, it came to my mind that we sometimes start programs that go big, big, big bang at the beginning. They just come out blockbuster at the start and sometimes they tend to tail off a little bit later on. This past January, we kicked off a campaign called Reread. We hadn't been in Bible classes for a year, and we decided we really need to be back in the Word. So, hey, let's as a church, let's read through the Bible again, right? Called it Reread 21. And so I thought, hey, this is a great time right here at mid-year to kind of re-support that, bring that back up to the forefront, and talk about that. So I asked Stuart Whiting and Dan Beasley and Todd White to each unpack a passage of Scripture for us. And we'll all kind of put it together and remember how important it is that we are studying, reading the Bible together. So that's what we're going to do this morning, and I appreciate their time and their effort to do that. So, would you stand with me? We're going to sing a lot about the Word. You can look for those lines as we sing together and as we worship. Thanks for being here. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. We believe in a God who is able to bring justice and mercy to all. And he promises strength for the journey to the steadfast to answer the call. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we can't 
cannot see. We still believe, let us be faithful, faithful Lord. We believe in the truth of the Bible, in its power and purpose today. There is meaning and life in its pages. We believe and we choose to obey. Let us be faithful, faithful, faithful Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. We believe that he's calling his people to embody his story of grace. Bringing rescue and hope to the broken. May our lives be an offering of praise. Let us be faithful, 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 Lord. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful. Let us be faithful, and though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Let us be faithful, let us be faithful, and though we cannot see, we still believe. Let us be faithful, faithful Lord. Spirit within me, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. So about a month ago in the reread schedule, we were reading the familiar story of Jonah and right away something stood out in the opening verses when the Lord tells Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh and call out against it for their evil has come before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and he found a ship, paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Of the Lord. See, that phrase, away from the presence of the Lord, is repeated and clearly being highlighted. And that theme is developed throughout the rest of the story of Jonah. And it should call, bring to mind something that is said about Cain in Genesis 4 after he kills his brother Abel. It says in verse 16, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And even that phrase sounds a lot like what happened and what is said about Cain's parents in Genesis chapter 3 when it says, Therefore the Lord God sent them out from the Garden of Eden. Mankind created to be in the Lord's presence over and over again. 
is pushed away, cast away from the Lord's presence because of choices that they are making. And I think something intentional is going on in the language, in the very choice of words that the writers are using to emphasize a point. So we just sang Create in Me from Psalm 51, which beginning in verse 9 says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Cast me not away from your presence. Reflecting on those other stories about being cast out of the presence of God. It's a major design pattern and key issue throughout the Old Testament. It shows up that phrase repeatedly in the books of Kings and Chronicles and throughout the prophets when speaking of the exiles of the entire nations of Israel and Judah, which are to come. And we know Psalm 51 was written by King David about actual events in his life. So let's back up and think about that. Starting in 2 Samuel 11, verse 2, it says, Late one afternoon when David was walking on the roof of the king's house, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David asked about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. See, let's just boil it down. David saw a beautiful woman and took her. This well-known story of his adultery with Bathsheba and subsequent murder of her husband Uriah is what David is lamenting in Psalm 51 that we just read after he is confronted about the sin. He doesn't want to be cast out of the presence of the Lord, but he does want the Lord to hide his sins from the Lord's face, but not himself. Now, about 400 years earlier in this story, we back up in the Bible several books, there's another familiar story to us about when Israel is entering the promised land and they defeat Jericho. You know, the walls come a-tumbling down. And in the aftermath, someone has sinned and the Lord has pointed it out. And Achan, one of the Israelites, confesses in Joshua 7 verse 20, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and I took them. See, Achan saw the beautiful things and took them. And that same pattern of words shows up back in that first story in Genesis 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Eve saw that desirable, beautiful fruit and took it. This see something beautiful and take pattern is repeated in a number of stories throughout the Old Testament. One example, which is not so obvious, is when Israel has demanded a king after they have come into the promised land. And they see how great a king Saul has to be because of what it says in 1 Samuel 9, there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. And from his shoulders upward, he was taller than all the people. Surely this is the guy we take for our king. And we should be left wondering, is this really going to work out? I think the language is intentional to, to call that to mind. Even Samuel, the man of God, the prophet, who is involved with this king selection, when he is asked by God to go to Jesse's household to find the next king after Saul, do you remember he sees Eliab and says, surely this is the guy. And yet the Lord tells him in 1 Samuel 16, 7 to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature. It's repeating that language from the Saul story. Because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And of course, it's the overlooked David who is revealed as the anointed one. Because God has seen what is good and what is best in the situation when man could not. 
It's almost as if the Bible doesn't want us to miss the truth that we do unspeakable damage to ourselves and to those around us when we see and take what we think is beautiful and what is best for us, but which may not be in line with God's values and precepts and teachings and commands, and that will lead us away from the presence of the Lord. And one way I think it does this is to use these similar word groupings and language patterns woven throughout these stories so that we just don't miss it. We need a little extra help at times to see the big points, and God doesn't want us to miss that. You see, every day we are David, and we are on the roof, and we see one that is not ours to take, and we have a choice. And every day we are Achan, and we see the beautiful things of Jericho that No one else is around, and we have a choice. And every day we are like Adam and Eve. We are standing in front of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we see that beautiful fruit, and we have a choice. Are we going to choose to choose what is best for us? Are we going to decide what is good for us? Or will we listen to the creator of the universe? So we know that the Old Testament points to Jesus. And even Jesus reminds us that the prophets were talking about him as Dan will unfold for us in a moment. And so the second verse of the next song came to mind as we were putting this together. So we should stand and sing the Church of Christ National Anthem together, if you would. There is beyond the azure blue A God concealed from human sight he tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God. There is a God. He is alive. He is alive. In him we live. In him we live. And we survive. And we survive from dust our God. From dust our God. We He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God. There is a God. He is alive. He is alive. In him we live. In him we live. And, we and we survive. From dust our God. From dust our God. We A life was willing there to give That he from sin might set men free And evermore with him could live There is a God There is a God He is alive alive. In him we live And we survive survive. From the star God From the star God Uh, reread 2021, a repeat of reread 2018, really been um, a, a big impact on my life. 2018 reread and the context that it occurred is just a rich experience for me, and it's it's being repeated in 2021. I I think of Luke 24 when I think of rereading uh, scripture. It's a passage. It's a, it's actually a passage about two rereadings of scripture, and I invite you to open. Uh, to Luke chapter 24. It's a story familiar to many of you in the room, two men walking toward a village named Emmaus who encounter the resurrected Jesus and, and don't miss this, encounter their scriptures. 
The empty tomb had been discovered by the women. They had told the apostles. The apostles rushed to the empty tomb and find it as the women had said. And meanwhile, Luke transitions to this strange story, only two, one of three stories Luke tells about the resurrection, of these two walking away from Jerusalem, talking about the latest news events. And Jesus uh, walks up beside them, listening to them talk about the things that had happened. And he, and he asks them, what's the conversation you're having? What are you talking about? And, uh, and they stop and they say, are you... Have you had your phone off or something? Your news feed quit working? You, don't, you hadn't gotten any of the contemporary news? You didn't hear what's going on? And, and he says, what things? <laughs> and he, they begin to tell him about uh, what had happened, that Jesus, the one who went viral up in Galilee, the prophet, who was saying amazing things and doing even more amazing things. And he had thousands of likes and thousands of followers, and he had led, him to, led them all to Jerusalem. And guess what? He died. And not only that, it was our followers, our leaders, our own leaders, who put him to death. And in verse 21, they say, and we were hoping he was the one to redeem Israel. Now, there's a lot packed in to this sentence that we don't have time to unpack, but they, they tip their hand to their, their view of their scriptures. To redeem Israel is sort of like you and I saying, give me liberty or give me death, and the whole story of the American Revolution opens before our eyes. To redeem Israel was the story of their Bible. It's what, that's the way the story was going to go. Their story is moving toward a king, a chosen one, an anointed one, or as they say here, the one. And he was going to destroy their enemies. Their adversaries would be in pieces. Roman occupation would end. Their enemies would lose and they would win. It was a partial understanding of scripture. It was a nationalized view of their scripture and it was simplified and it was incomplete. This story was not about a crucified Messiah for a dead Messiah is no Messiah at all. Who would rather, who rather than crushing Rome would himself allow Rome to crush him. That wasn't what they had read about. And in verse 24, Jesus said to them, fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And so, you know, essentially Jesus says, have you, have you read your Bible? Have you actually read it? They were thinking they had just told him about their Bible and what it said. Apparently, they, actually, they either hadn't read it or, as Jesus said, says here, they hadn't believed what they had read. Whatever they believed, it was not what the actual Bible said, what the actual words of the prophets were. So in verse 27 of chapter 24, Luke tells us, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Just a few moments later, these two are going to go back to Jerusalem with the rest of the disciples, and Jesus is going to appear there. And in very similar fashion, he's going to reread the Bible for them and open the scriptures for them. And with these words, it's recorded in verse 44, these are the words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So, so what is Jesus speaking of here when he says Moses and all the prophets, or Moses and all the prophets and the Psalms, he's, this, this is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. It wasn't called the Old Testament. It was referred to by Jesus and by the writers of Scripture with various names such as these, Moses and the prophets, Moses the prophets and the Psalms. 
It predates Christianity by hundreds of years. It was old at the time Jesus was living. And it wasn't in this form. It was in a group of, it was a group of scrolls that they, they had organized, perhaps in the way we might organize the Star Wars trilogy. It was organized in their minds on a timetable, on a storyline. And Jesus had clearly saturated himself with these texts. Uh, scholars have noted that if you take the red letters, the words of Jesus, almost one in ten words that come out of his mouth are these texts. They're these words. It's as if he had memorized the whole thing, if not memorized it entirely, whole sections of it. Uh, he, was, he was not only memorizing it, but he was becoming it. He was, he was fulfilling it. It was as if... He was it. And he makes this claim, which he made throughout his life, that he believed this story, this story was about him, that he was the one that was written about in the scriptures. I, um, and I don't know if on occasion my wife will sometimes hear a song, and sometimes it's a song I've heard many times before, and, and she'll send it to me with this on her Spotify, on Spotify or however, and say to me, hey, you got to listen to this song. It's about us. It's about me. And, and, and it's a song I've heard before, but you know what? I listen to the song again. And in, in listening to the song, why, why do I listen to the song? Because I love her. And I want to understand her. And she's just told me the song's about her. And in listening to the song... I gain insight and I understand about her. And not only that, the song takes on new meaning. I understand the song in a way I've never understood the song before. And perhaps it's a song I've heard lots of times before, but suddenly it's alive with meaning in explaining her and, her explain, and it explaining her. Jesus believed these scriptures explained himself. If we love him, we read these scriptures to understand him. So with these two, and then a little later with all these disciples, he sat down and he reread, he retold the scriptures to them. You have to wonder how many times they reread their Bible after that, with fresh eyes, or as it says in Luke 4, with a burning heart, uh, with, op an opening, with an open mind. I suspect they couldn't put the scrolls down from this point forward. There's another thing that's intriguing about this story. It's interesting where it clicked with them, where their eyes were opened and where it all kind of came together. And it happened in verse 30. The text there says, as he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Now, if you've tracked with what Stuart was just telling us and the way we read Scripture and a skill set we need to have in reading Scripture, then you're already catching it, aren't you? This is a blue, glowing blue hyperlink Luke is giving us to two pages back where he describes the scene where Jesus, the night before he was murdered, and the Scripture says in Luke 14, he reclined at table, he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. This is my body, he says, which was given. Do this in remembrance of me. In fact, there are five hyperlinks there. A table, a bread, he give, giving thanks, breaking it, and handing it to them. It's interesting um, that before the Jews had the written law at Mount Sinai, they had a meal. The Passover meal, Luke, I mean, Exodus 12, comes before Exodus 19. And they were practicing the Passover meal before the Ten Commandments. And it's a, it's a meal that's thousands of years celebrated even to this day. It's a meal that tells a story. And each piece of the meal is a reminder of a piece of the story. And then the, the, in the, the Jews actually eat the story. They actually take, as they're, as they're telling the story, they eat the story. 
and it's older than the commandments themselves. It's interesting, Jesus didn't write a book. We have no letters from Jesus. What he gave us is a meal. He takes this ancient memorial, Passover, and he reshapes it around his, his story, around himself, the very same story with modifications. And he, takes, he tells his followers to tell the story and then eat it. It's, it's pretty graphic, isn't it? To put it, put it into your body. And it's their story, it's his story, and it's our story. And it's in that, that moment that their eyes are opened and they see their scriptures and they see him in a brand new way. Um, and that's what we celebrate today as we celebrate uh, his supper together. Let's pray. Jesus, as we eat this meal in your presence, as you did for these two and for these disciples, do for us and open our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll hold the bread until we conclude this song. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide, where all the love I've ever found comes like the flood. Cross at the 
cross I surrender my life I made all of you I made all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Jesus let's pray again God we do owe all to you all that we are all that we have all that we will be all because of you. We're grateful for the blood that washes us white, that makes us whole and forgiven and redeemed and saved. And we thank you for the sacrifice in spite of its brutality that we enjoy now and forevermore. Thank you for this cup. May we remember it every day as we share it together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's a place where sin is shame are powerless where my heart We've talked this morning about how the scriptures point to Jesus. But one question I'd like us to ask and see if we can answer is, why is it important for us as a church and individually to read through those scriptures daily? Why is it important to encounter scripture on a regular, consistent, and daily basis? To begin to answer that, I'd like us to start in John chapter 15. And if you want to open your Bibles or your device, you can read along. These are the words of Jesus. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, 
You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. These are some of the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before his arrest and crucifixion. So we get a sense of their weight and importance, not only for those who heard them, but for us. Using a powerful illustration of a branch connected to a vine, Jesus is reminding his followers of the need to remain closely connected to him or in his words, to abide in him. Abiding in Jesus is a choice that we make daily. And according to Jesus, it's a choice that leads to one of two clear but very different outcomes. Either, number one, we abide in him, we remain closely connected to the vine, in which case, he says, we will bear much fruit. And what is that fruit? Well, I would submit that that fruit is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's the fruit that is evident in our lives as an overflow of a real relationship with Jesus. And it serves as proof that we are his disciples. The second alternative, the other choice we can make, is to not abide. It's to allow ourselves to become disconnected from the life-giving vine. And the result of a disconnected life is a branch that withers. It's gathered and it's thrown into the fire because, as Jesus tells us, Apart from him, we can do nothing. So how do we cultivate an abiding relationship in Jesus? I think first and foremost, abiding in Jesus includes abiding daily in the word. It includes daily interaction with our scriptures, daily interaction with the story of God, as we've talked about this morning, that points to Jesus. Abiding means we become a people who delight in God's Word and allow God's Word to shape our thoughts and our actions. I can't help but wonder if Jesus, as he painted this incredible picture of the vine and its connected branch bearing fruit, wasn't perhaps thinking of the opening words of the book of Psalms. It says this, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, 
and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The law of the Lord that's referenced here in Psalm 1 clearly has a double meaning. It, it would have meant for the Jews that were reading it at their time uh, a reference to the Torah, the law that was given by God to the Jewish people. But clearly it has a broader connotation here. It also refers to the overall instruction and precepts of God that are contained in the totality of our scripture, our, of our Bible that we have today. And the Apostle John made the clear connection between God's Word and Jesus in John chapter 1. Listen to how he described it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Scriptures convey to us God's story. They provide us with His commands, with His instructions, with His precepts. They give us insight into God's heart and into His purpose. They are our guide as Jody talked about last week, and the lens through which we see this world. Most importantly, though, the Scriptures point us to Jesus, the Word that became flesh. If we want to have an abiding relationship with our Lord, then we need to engage God's Word daily. And that's why it's important. By spending time in the Scriptures, and encountering the living word in the person of Jesus. That's why this journey, I think, is so important. It's not just an exercise in self-discipline. Certainly reading scripture every day and spending time with our Lord requires discipline. But its real purpose is to develop or to enhance an abiding relationship with him. That's why we do it. Our desire as a church is that we would all come to know Jesus, not, not just know about him, as the two disciples on the road to Emmaus did initially, but to know him, and the scriptures help us to do that. And then we want to see the fruit of the Spirit evident in our lives that are an outpouring and overflow of an abiding relationship. If we abide in Him daily, then we will begin to see God in our circumstances, no matter what they are, good or bad. If we abide in Him daily, we'll better understand and obey His commands, commands that are for our good and for His glory. If we abide in Him daily, we will learn to see others as Jesus sees them and to love them as He loves them. And finally, I think if we abide daily in Him, we will bear the fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit. And that fruit will be evidence to the world around us that God is indeed active. And that's what we hope to do. If you've not yet joined us on this journey, as Lincoln mentioned earlier today, we invite you to do so. You can go to our website, and there's a place there for the reread program where you can pick up right where we are. We're in the wisdom literature right now here in June, and you can finish out with us. If you started, but you lost your way, maybe lost in the wilderness somewhere in Leviticus, Numbers, or Deuteronomy, I invite you to pick it back up and start anew. And if you're on the journey and you're continuing, please stay the course. This is important. It's not just a discipline. It's critical. It's essential for us as disciples, as followers of Jesus, to abide in Him. Let's do that as a church together. Let's pray. Father, thank You for, uh, for Your Word, for the Scriptures, for the reminder this morning that uh, we can reread them and just see uh, the pattern that is there the way that the scriptures so eloquently point to Jesus and ultimately our salvation. And so, Father, we just pray that as we encounter your word, that our hearts would be open. I pray that as we spend time daily, that we would learn to abide with you, Jesus, 
and that through that abiding relationship, we would enjoy the fruit in our lives as evidence to all that you're at work. And we hope that all of this, Father, brings you glory, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. For love is of God, he who loves is born of God, and knows God, he who does not love, does not know God, for God is love, God is love, love one another, for love. things to share with you. Number one, a schedule change. New schedule. Actually, it's an old schedule that we're going back to. Most of this doesn't matter to you because you don't come to first service, but as of next week, there is no first service. We killed it. Maybe it'll come back someday. Who knows? But for right now, it's dead. Thank goodness. Just kidding. Totally kidding. We will, however, be restarting Bible classes. Nine o'clock, Bible classes next Sunday. Our teachers haven't taught in a year and a half, and they are busting with new information. They are so excited. It's going to be incredible. And next week, we're having Krispy Kreme donuts in the classrooms, because we know that if we offer food, there's an astronomically greater chance that some of you will come. So <laughs> we figured that out. Donuts next Sunday, 9 o'clock, and then our one worship service at 10 o'clock. Secondly, for all of our children's ministry families, so sorry the weather didn't work out. We had to pull the plug because we had all the inflatables coming, had all this food and all this stuff. However, the shelf life of a hot dog is about 37 years. So we're postponing till next Sunday. We're confident the food will still be fine. We'll have everything back. So we'll just do this thing next Sunday, just like we would have today, unless it rains again or something. Last, not lastly, thirdly, if you placed membership in the last year and a half, we have not been able to have a new member lunch, and we're going to have our first one in the year and a half, Sunday, June the 27th. So if you placed membership, you were invited to that lunch. If you are thinking about placing membership, you were invited to this lunch on June the 27th. If this is your first Sunday to ever be here, and you would like a free meal, you're invited to this luncheon on June 27th. That's two Sundays from now. It'll be in the fellowship hall downstairs. We want to invite and encourage. If you'd like to know more about us, we do a little 
discussion about who we are and what we do and why we do it. So that could be very interesting. Please let us know. Lastly, Dinner Devo tickets are available in the Fellowship Hall, in the Whitesburg lobby, online, or you can call the office, Kroger, Publix, Sam's, no, that's not right. Just the first four. But we need you to get them today so that we know how much food to have, barbecue sandwiches this week, Wednesday at six, so be back with us then. And until then, I hope you have a great week. May the amazing grace of Jesus bless you and give you peace.